Hello everybody, my name is Professor Sobor Isaac Barry from Barry Science Lab. Today we are going to be talking about the game of chess. Chess is a very interesting game. It is the literal definition of very easy to learn and very hard to master. There's only like about, I'd say, 10,000 grandmasters in the world, which may sound like a lot, but let me remind you that there are nearly 8 billion people in this world. Now does 10,000 seem so big? So, anyway, today I'm going to teach you how the pieces in chess move, and the history of chess, and some interesting but weird tactics that were implemented. All right, for a start, let's start with the simplest piece, the pawn. So, the pawn is, you know, a peasant. So, it barely has the energy to move two squares. At the start, it can either move one square or two squares forward from its base. I like to call the back row the base, but whatever. So it can move either two spaces that was a feature implemented, or it could just move one space from its beginning spot. Then after the pawn will move two or one spaces, it can only move one space forward for the rest of the game. There are two interesting rules involved with this. The first, is that when the pawn reaches the other side of the board, it does something called promotion, in which it can promote to any kind of piece except the pawn or the king. Because, you know, you can't have checkmate when you have two kings lying around. So, now that we know what the pawn does, let's get to the second interesting rule about the pawn, on croissant. Basically, let's say you have a white pawn and the black pawn is shown in this picture over here. Now, the pawn has another interesting rule involved with it. That is en passant. That comes from French. Now, let's look at this picture of a white and a black pawn. Now, let's say the black pawn moves two spaces like we described earlier. Kind of like this. So, after that happens, then white can still take that passed pawn by going diagonally, even though the passed pawn is not on that diagonal square. It's a very weird rule, but it exists. So what can you do? Now, let's get to the second um, least valuable piece. Now, the knight had no more interesting special moves involved with it. So let's just move to the bishop. The bishop is actually worth the same amount of points in terms of material, but it's also worth much more in actual gameplay. When you use a bishop, then uh, it can only move on the diagonal, the, uh, on the square diagonal it can move on. So it can only move diagonally, meaning that if it's uh, on one square, it's, if it's on a colored square, then it'll stay on that colored square forever. So that's why there are two bishops, one that can control the white squares by going diagonally, and one that can control the black or dark or colored squares going diagonally. All right, now what makes this bishop so powerful? Well, some players who are unwary might not be able to see a bishop attacking one of their valuable pieces, and it can uh, use a, and it can be used to strike down an important piece like the queen or a rook. Speaking of the rook, let's move to the rook right now. Rook is one of the most valuable pieces in the game, with the material advantage of five if you take one from your opponent. So, what did the rook do? Well, let's see. The rook can move in a straight line. It might not seem important, but it is extremely important because of a tactic called a skew, which we'll use when we get to the, the king again. So, other than that, the rook can only move in straight lines. And it's not too valuable, but it's still pretty good in late game. Now, let's move on to the little strongest piece in the game. That is the queen. The queen basically has the abilities of both the rook and the bishop. So that means it can move both in a straight line and diagonally. It's uh, the most powerful piece in the game. And it is literally the, a dominator. And 
you can use this to literally just push around your opponent's king until it's pinned to the floor. And it commonly delivers checkmate. It's the most powerful piece in the game. I'll tell you that. And it can also commit skewers. Without further ado, let us get to the definitely not most powerful, but most important piece in the entire game. The king. The king is what chess is really based on. You only get one. The queen, you can get another one by promoting. And you can do the same for every single uh, other piece. And the pawn, you already have eight of them. So who cares if you lose one? But the queen, the king, the king is one of its own kind. It can move to any square adjacent to its square. But there's something that makes it really important. What? It's not its value or its power. Those are way too low. The value of the king, the importance of the king, lies in check and checkmate. When you're in check, you literally have to get the king out of danger. It's the must. And you can either do this by moving a piece to protect your king, or you can take your king and you can move it to another square. Like in this scenario where a rook is trying to bash the king before the king gets away. Now, the final rule we will talk about today is checkmate. Now, checkmate is basically what happens when the king cannot block an attack and it cannot move in any square to get out of the attack. Checkmate comes from Samat, meaning the king is hopeless or helpless. So the skewer is basically what happens when the king is lined up with another piece. What if a rook delivers a check to a king while the king is in front of a piece? Well, that's called a skewer. Let's say you have a rook skewering a king and a queen, like in this picture. That means the rook is checking the king and if the king ha can go out of danger, like in the six spots it has over here, it has to give up the queen. And the, the rook and the bishop are incredibly powerful for being able to use this ability. The knight, however, since it had limited range, cannot do this in the pawn. Well, you know already. So, that's what a skewer is. Now let's get to the final thing. A fork. Now there are two kinds of forks. A fork and an absolute fork. A fork is what happens when you take two pieces, non-king pieces, and you uh, are attacking them both. So, to get one out of danger, you have to give up the other. Yeah. And this is what a fork is. There are two kinds of forks. A fork and an absolute fork. First of all, a fork is when you take two non-king pieces and then attack them both with one piece. That is what it's called a fork. And then, to let one survive, you have to let the other go. So that's what a fork is called. Now, what is an absolute fork? Well, it's when you have a king and uh, some non-king piece, and you take one piece, you move that, and you uh, fork them. That means that the king literally has to move.